All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Greetings, my name is Josh Bruce, and on behalf of the Cascadia Region Earthquake Work Group, I want to welcome you to our first webcast in our series focusing on earthquake recovery and mitigation that we'll be holding over the next year. Before introducing Jay Wilson, our featured presenter, I want to briefly tell you a little bit about CREW. The Cascadia Region Earthquake Work Group is a coalition of private and public representatives working together to improve the ability of communities throughout the Cascadia Region to reduce the effects of earthquakes and related hazards, such as tsunami. CREW's goals are to, one, promote efforts to reduce the loss of life and property damage from earthquakes, two, to educate and motivate decision makers, managers, and the general public to reduce risks associated with earthquakes, and three, to foster productive linkages between scientists, critical infrastructure providers, businesses, and governmental agencies in order to improve the resilience of communities after an earthquake. For more information about CREW, I encourage you to visit our website at www.crew.org. And now on to today's webinar. The title of the webinar is Magnitude 9.0 Paradigm Shift, Post-Disaster Reconnaissance of Tohoku, Japan. The presentation will highlight the catastrophic impacts from a magnitude 9.0 earthquake and tsunami that hit coastal areas of northeastern Japan. Discussion will address the loss of emergency and other government functions and observations from the perspective of a local emergency manager from Oregon. Will Oregon make this paradigm shift before or after the coming Cascadia event? The webinar is being presented today by Jay Wilson. Jay Wilson has been a professional emergency manager since 1997, and his career has focused on hazard mitigation. He has been the hazard mitigation coordinator for Clackamas County since 2008, and he currently serves on the Oregon Seismic Safety Policy Commission. Jay has previously worked for Oregon Emergency Management as the Earthquake, Tsunami, and Volcano Program Coordinator with the Federal Emergency Management Agency as a reservist for community outreach and education for mitigation, and he also uh, has worked for the cities of Oakland and Berkeley as an Earthquake Program Coordinator. Jay holds a master's degree in geography and a bachelor's in film. So without, uh, without further introduction uh, from me, I'd like to uh, uh, bring Jay Wilson on, who will be presenting today's webinar. Thank you, Josh. Good morning. I uh, appreciate so much uh, the opportunity and um, really the, the, the honor of being uh, selected as the, uh, the person to kick off this webcast series for CREW. Um, this uh, presentation is one I've uh, given a number of times since I returned from the visit that I had to, uh, to northeastern Honshu uh, in June. And um, I'm very, uh, very happy to share this with as many people as I can uh, from the perspective of a local emergency manager who's uh, bringing back um, what I think are very important uh, issues for consideration for uh, the Pacific Northwest especially when we uh, someday in the future will have our uh, own version of uh, the March 11th uh, earthquake and tsunami that affected Japan. Um, I also want to... Uh, uh, say thank you uh, and uh, my appreciations to the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute for allowing me to be a member of this social science uh, reconnaissance team. Um, I worked with a, a, an amazing group of people who were uh, on this uh, trip with me that I, uh, I won't go into naming everyone, but um, CREW has posted links for the report that we issued for government and societal impacts uh, as well as uh, a personal blog that I uh, had posted on the EERI uh, Tohoku site. So with that, um, I'll get going and uh, we'll be available for questions uh, via the moderator uh, after the presentation is over. Um, when I've given this presentation, I, uh, I like to start with a video clip that I had shot um, when we were in Minami Sanriku. Um, a coastal, uh, small coastal community um, in uh, Miyagi Pro Prefecture. But it, it's so hard to bring back the visceral uh, uh, experience of actually being there. And uh, this is uh, my, my best attempt to try and have kind of an emotional um, uh, uh, entry point for this presentation. 
So I'm going to uh, play this very short clip and um, just narrate a little bit about what you're seeing uh, as this is playing. And I hope uh, it's going to be a little jittery because it's a high-definition video. Um, our group was there in uh, the uh, third week or so of June. Uh, it was just after the three-month mark, about 100 days out. And uh, there was still uh, so much evidence of uh, the, uh, the damage and the intensity of the, uh, of the tsunami, not to mention the debris that was left behind. Uh, this is uh, taken from the, the bus that our group was, uh, was traveling on. We were moving from uh, the road, from the harbor, and coming back across the city. And earlier in this clip, you could see uh, three-story apartments that had debris on the, on the top of them. Uh, now the video is moving through uh, the main part of the town. Everything that's missing is basically where residential housing used to be. Uh, wood frame housing that's been stripped all the way down to the foundation. Only steel frame buildings, uh, the skeletons of those remain, and a few um, reinforced concrete buildings. We had evidence in all of uh, the communities of, of you know, major debris clearing that was going on everywhere. We saw lots of uh, areas where uh, debris was being uh, cleared for roadways to allow um, removal of material. Uh, here in Manami San Riku, there were three river channels that uh, that came into the city, and as we'll see a little bit later, those provided an entryway for the tsunami to come and penetrate deeply into the city. Um, we also uh, saw uh, just the remains of business districts uh, in areas um, like this. I also got this clip. Uh, from the opposite side of the bus, looking at the hospital that was right down uh, facing the harbor uh, in Manami Senriku. This is uh, the, the emergency room entrance. And you can see um, a steel frame, uh, probably from a large sign or a building, that's wrapped around the entrance there. Um, the water penetrated all, all, all the way to almost the top of the fourth floor on the portion of the building on the right. And then. Uh, Anyone who was able to um, to evacuate up to the top of this fifth floor, the fifth floor structure, were the only survivors. And then this is really showing us uh, this area as we drove out of town, uh, heading you know back up into the valleys uh, at the back of the city. And what you can see here uh, is still lots of debris that's being cleared and staged. There are a number of trees in the background that are brown, that have been killed by the uh, salt water. We saw these kinds of brown bathtub rings around uh, these areas where there may not have been damage, but it would show where salt water had penetrated up into these areas. And then lastly, this video clip um, has this very brief view here of a little 7-Eleven uh, truck uh, on NHK television. The week we were there, it was talking about these these uh, 7-Eleven trucks that were showing up in the damage areas where it was some of the first instances of businesses coming back in and getting a foothold uh, into areas that had been uh, devastated. Uh, these were usually these national or, or multinational businesses like 7-Eleven that had resources to do this. But uh, this was to provide um, some small goods through a refrigerated truck and a canopy uh, to both the neighborhoods that uh, that didn't uh, have damage, which if you were out of the tsunami zone, you were fairly undamaged, and then um, also to people who were working there at the site. So that's just um, a very brief video clip that's meant to introduce this presentation. Um, I've titled this Magnitude 9 Paradigm Shift because uh, for me um, this is all about uh, about getting it, about understanding what this uh, means for um, for the Pacific Northwest. Um, prior to March 11th, uh, for the most part, the Japanese uh, scientists and uh, and the public uh, didn't anticipate or understand that there was a uh, capacity for a magnitude nine earthquake mm -hmm. tsunami, uh, to affect their area. Um, Although they were uh, highly uh, prepared and have done uh, 
so much mitigation um, and have some of the, uh, the heaviest levels of investment in their infrastructure for protection. Um, you know, most of this are for smaller scale earthquakes uh, and certainly smaller scale tsunamis. And so they've had to make a magnitude 9 paradigm shift based on a reaction, based on the fact that this has happened and they weren't anticipating it. For us, uh, especially Oregon, uh, we have less seismicity uh, certainly than Japan, but also than California or Washington. And uh, the, the implication is that um, uh, since while we don't have as much investment in seismic uh, strengthening and uh, tsunami countermeasures like they do, uh, we do have an understanding uh, that uh, we will have a magnitude 9. But um, in reality, uh, our cultures, our, our governments, uh, our communities have really not made this paradigm shift yet to understand that this is indeed a fabric of, of, of being here. And uh, the question I ask at the beginning of this presentation, and it's basically how I conclude, is what is it going to take for us to make this magnitude 9 paradigm shift? Can we do it before we have our event, or do we have to wait until the event happens in order to integrate this understanding into uh, how our uh, communities are developed? So there's been a lot of people asking about the earthquake damage that occurred there. Certainly there was. Um, our group uh, was primarily focused on uh, the impacts due to the tsunami. I have just this single image that I'm using as a representation just right up front to say uh, in Sendai and um, Ishinomaki and a number of uh, cities uh, inland of where the tsunami was, we saw um, small scale damages, uh, damages that certainly would reflect um, low levels of damage for such a large earthquake. A lot of it was um, cosmetic to buildings, it wasn't structural. There was uh, evidence of liquefaction, as you see in this uh, image, where the sidewalk has, uh, has buckled and sank, and there's been uh, sand and gravel uh, pushed out. But um, I'm just putting this here as um, more or less a placeholder for the fact that we witnessed it, but um, most of our emphasis was on uh, the, the, the complete uh, level of, uh, of intense damage that came from the tsunami event. Here's an outline of uh, the, the major points that I want to cover, these are also the major points for the report that I mentioned uh, that EERI has uh, published from our group. And uh, the big issue here, as an emergency manager speaking, uh, especially to other emergency managers and people who work in government, is this connection that government has, and especially uh, emergency management has, to each of these categories. Um, uh, and, and this goes from the local government level through the state and or the prefecture level in Japan up to the national level. Um, that uh, There's a, a great deal of investment beforehand, during, and after an event. And um, all of these areas um, were, were, for the most part, overwhelmed in their planning uh, for uh, what they anticipated would be uh, 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 a probable event rather than a possible event. Our group started um, in northern Iwate Prefecture in Kuji, and uh, we traveled south uh, over a five-day period. We visited um, a number of uh, communities, 12 in fact. Uh, some of them we, we just simply drove through. Others we spent quite a bit of time and met with um, local government, state government, even uh, the national government uh, in uh, Shinomaki, or I should say in Sendai. Um, but, uh, and these numbers certainly are um, not current. These are numbers that came from our direct uh, research and uh, the, the research that was available to us at the time. I should also acknowledge that um, there's uh, a lot of work and uh, research and, and results that have come out since our uh, publication came out uh, in August. And so, um, again, I want to uh, just say that what this presentation is about is, is really reflecting uh, certainly my direct observations and the report that this is referenced from. But um, it still provides a very strong basis for uh, 
a lot of discussion points uh, for communities in the Northwest, on the coast especially. The, one of the things that came up a lot when we were there talking with our Japanese colleagues that hosted us were um, what were going to be the, the disaster plans uh, going forward. And um, right around the time that we were uh, leaving to come back to the United States uh, and Canada, there were, um, I should say, this report came out. Uh, this is just a, a reference to it in this newspaper article. But uh, the big issue was that uh, Japan was, was very publicly acknowledging that their planning was insufficient, certainly at a national level, but the implications and acknowledgments go all the way down to the prefecture and local level. And um, it was no small thing for uh, the Japanese government to make this um, very uh, public acknowledgment and basically say that they have to start over in regards to planning for future magnitude 9 events and uh, trying to understand where those possibilities are. But um, this uh, certainly uh, says a lot for us about whether our disaster plans are uh, adequate or accurate enough for um, the magnitude 9 events that uh, are in our future. Um, I don't have a lot of technical slides in this presentation, but this is uh, one I wanted to just quickly refer to. Um, all of these fault segments that you can see off of this, uh, off the shoreline of Japan, um, were uh, the basically what the estimations were for, for either maximum uh, and or probable uh, uh, earthquakes on each of these segments. And you can see um, a number of them uh, are in the uh, seven and a half to eights. There aren't any there that uh, are uh, laid out or dedicated to being a potential magnitude nine. But in fact, um, this area that just popped up in the circle on uh, the slide represents that there were actually multiple fault segments that ruptured on March 11th, uh, not a single one. And uh, this is uh, the basis for how um, much the underestimation was for, um, for what the largest possible event could be uh, along the uh, San Riku coastline. Um, and in fact, um, it was a very complex uh, rupture. And um, I think there's a lot of implications for the Pacific Northwest and Cascadia in terms of how well we actually understand subduction zone fault behavior as well um, that, uh, that we need to pay close attention to. One of the biggest uh, takeaways that our group had was this whole idea of, of underestimating the, the hazard, the, the not putting all your, your eggs basically on the the middle of the bell curve where the, the probabilities are, but if you don't take into account these, these outliers that are on the far end of that bell curve and, you, and you're wrong about uh, that assumption, then uh, all of your other uh, planning and protective measures are going to be subject to failure. One example I wanted um, to share is uh, this one about the tsunami warning system. Uh, these are some slides uh, from the Japanese, uh, the Japan Meteorological Agency, but they they just highlight how uh, how robust their uh, detection and warning system is. Uh, a lot of it's based on their seismic arrays that they have, but uh, they're very uh, good and quick about getting these uh, warnings issued, especially um, uh, for areas right uh, along where the the um, epicenter is, which is where the X is. So uh, within four minutes, they uh, they promptly got a warning out for three to ten uh, uh, three meters along the affected area. But uh, the problem being that um, four minutes, the earthquake was actually still rupturing. And so uh, there's a 7.9 that's listed uh, at the top of the map, and uh, I think that that was um, for the fault segment that they believe ruptured. That was the biggest earthquake that they had. Uh, set up for that area. Uh, 28 minutes later, uh, they probably had a number of um, uh, remote sensing uh, detections coming in from either sea gauges or GPS. Uh, anyway, they were aware that uh, they needed to revise this uh, upwards from what they originally did. And then 45 minutes later was when they finally uh, went to 
10 meters and, and probably greater for uh, the affected areas, but by 45 minutes, uh, that's actually when the tsunami was making landfall in most locations. And um, we learned that um, in a number of places, the last warning that most people heard was the one that came at the very beginning uh, within four minutes. Um, and I think uh, many people chose either uh, not to evacuate um, because of uh, they trusted the seawalls or felt like that that wasn't a, a serious threat, um, or um, that evacuating to uh, an area that seemed safe but uh, was inadequate, either uh, for vertical evacuation or, or going inland but not far enough. So I, I opened up this presentation with uh, a short video clip from Minami Senriku, and um, I'm going to use uh, a, a few images from this community just to um, really drill a little bit deeper into this event, and um, uh, especially for emergency managers. Uh, this is an image taken uh, uh, prior to the event, and I think it, uh, it really shows an idyllic uh, coastal community um, that's uh, probably functioning at a very uh, high sustained level for its scale in terms of the aquaculture that it has, in terms of tourism, in terms of having uh, regional rail service. Um, it, uh, I'm sure it was a very, a very nice place to live and to visit. Um, this pink inundation area that uh, is in the center in the, in the red box is showing uh, the map tsunami inundation zones that were put together in the days and weeks following uh, the event. Um, My advance advancer is not moving. Hmm. Here we go. Um, so I apologize for the delay. This is an aerial photograph that was taken within a couple of days of the tsunami event, and. Um, it's very striking uh, to see the extent of, uh, of, of not only the inundation, but how it's annihilated uh, pretty much the entire built environment uh, in the areas where the tsunami reached. Looking down from the lower right uh, and going across, uh, you can see the three apartment buildings in the lower right-hand corner where the video started. Um, it tracked. Um, kind of diagonally through uh, through the area and crossing the third bridge, and then we drove in front of where the hospital is. And um, uh, it, um, it's still uh, very hard for me to, um, to let go of the feelings I had of, uh, of just being overwhelmed when I was there, even if it was just for a few hours, trying to imagine uh, our coastal communities um, having to pick up the pieces again and move forward. Um, one of the things that we were paying attention to, and I know it's going to be a, a source of a lot of future investment, is this uh, idea of vertical evacuation. Uh, we were looking around for examples of vertical evacuation, especially that, uh, that had performed and had provided a refuge for people. This is a, an apartment or a condominium that faces the harbor there at Manami Senriku. And while you can see how high uh, the debris and water lines were on the building, um, it did provide refuge for a number of people on the roof overnight. Um, you can see this large fenced gate that goes around the perimeter. Um, well, I think I'm going to have to close a, uh, a video clip if I'm going to proceed because um, I think my computer's hanging up a little bit. I don't know if this is part of the interface or if it's just um, my machine right here. Hmm. Well, I'm not... Uh, Let's see if that goes. There we go. I may have to do this uh, via my mouse. Sorry again for the delay. Uh, this is a shot looking back across that same 
condominium or, or apartment building uh, looking back towards the city. And what I want to emphasize here about um, the, the challenges of vertical evacuation is that um, anyone who, who elects to stay and, and, uh, and, and uh, seek survival, basically, uh, on a building like this on the rooftop is that uh, you're still inside the tsunami hazard area. Um, you're still uh, potentially going to be exposed to uh, a, an unknown level of, of the hazard in that area, uh, albeit uh, flooding, albeit fires, albeit aftershocks. For many of the people, um, or I should say certainly in Minami Senriku, um, this event happened in late afternoon, and right at nightfall it started snowing. And uh, the people who were on the rooftop who had to cling to the rooftop as waves broke and in some cases surged uh, uh, over the, you know, through their legs over the rooftop, um, I'm sure it was a harrowing night of, uh, of surviving and then having to be rescued the next day because the buildings were so littered with debris uh, that they couldn't even get out. And so uh, the design factors that we have for areas that we're going to designate as tsunami refuges um, seriously have to consider um, uh, the level of uncertainty we have in the event we're facing, and so they need to build in additional degrees of, uh, of clearances and tolerances for, uh, for an event such as this. Um, likewise, uh, in Oregon, we're uh, looking at options for pathways to high ground. Uh, there were a number of locations that had temples that were built just up these hillsides and had stairways and uh, a number of uh, examples of where people were able to use these stairways to seek high ground and uh, and get out of harm's way. Um, I know in Oregon, especially a number of the the, the steeper beaches. Uh, if you're out on the, the the beach looking back, it's not always clear uh, exactly where you would go in an emergency to uh, to find your way to a designated uh, tsunami evacuation area. And it's uh, it's one thing that we may do to invest. Uh, in these types of uh, pedestrian uh, bridges and walkways uh, to ensure safe uh, uh, evacuation for people. So this is the Emergency Operations Center um, in uh, Manami San Riku. It was uh, right in the, the heart of the city, uh, kind of behind the hospital, away from the harbor, but it was in an area that was, uh, that was residential and business. Uh, it's a three-story steel frame structure, and um, I said I'm sure many of you uh, have heard the stories here. I just wanted to quickly recount it for those uh, who haven't, uh, especially when it comes to the role not only of the emergency officials in the town, but many of the public officials uh, who uh, who work for this community. Um, these photographs were taken from the roof after the tsunami had started to come. Uh, into the town via the river channels. Um, this is uh, looking, if um, you can see the tsunami tower, uh, one of the warning towers uh, in, the, in the center here. This is looking uh, to the left at about 6 or 7 o'clock from the roof. The um, 12 o'clock would be um, looking out straight at the harbor. Um, this is a photograph looking back from one of the hillsides. Uh, and you can see in the, the foreground on the right uh, a number of people who have evacuated to the roof of the EOC. The hospital is in the background. And even in the further distance, you can see through the dust and haze the, um, the eva tsunami evacuation building. Uh, in this photograph, the tsunami waters are starting to penetrate inland. This is just a close-up of people who are still evacuating onto the roof uh, from the EOC and other uh, areas of the city. I think about 30 staff from the city uh, had chosen to take refuge on uh, the roof of the EOC. This is another photo taken by um, a member of the, the group that was on the roof uh, looking at about 10 or 11 o'clock. The, the, the river in the uh, diagonally across the picture is starting to be a, a conduit for all of the debris that's being um, the, the ha smashed houses that are being washed in. Um, uh, probably seconds later, uh, this is a river channel that's completely inundated. And 
homes and, and buildings that are being swept away that just adjacent almost to the EOC. And then this is a photograph taken uh, from the top of the EOC looking out towards the harbor as uh, pretty much the entire city is overwhelmed and underwater um, as the waves are crashing and breaking across the roof line of this uh, three-story building. This photograph uh, is very dramatic, and it shows the the staff members who are basically hanging on for their lives, both on the antenna mast and uh, at the top of the the railings of the uh, the fire escape uh, stairs, um, uh, and then you can see the hospital in the background, uh, at least the wing that was overwhelmed all the way to its top uh, top story. And then this is the uh, the, the final photo uh, during the event. As the first uh, inundation was starting to recede, only 10 of the 30 who evacuated uh, actually survived the, uh, the at least the initial inundation. Um, I had read an article of uh, Jen Sato, the the mayor who survived, and he said they uh, that they basically clung to life uh, for the, throughout the night and had to find things like their neckties to burn to just to try to keep warm until daybreak when they had to climb down uh, all of the debris to get to the ground. Uh, Mickey Endo at the bottom of the screen has become a national hero for um, remaining at her post until the very last minute, uh, calling to people from the loudspeakers for people to evacuate. And so this is a photo that I took the day we were there. This is showing what remains of the EOC. And I understand uh, that the mayor is intending to leave this uh, as it is, uh, as uh, a remembrance of both uh, the victims who died uh, while they were on duty, but also uh, as a permanent reminder to never forget that this happened and that it could happen again. Um, it's, it's a very strong um, statement com compared, uh, I think, to some of the other uh, memorial markers that were in town for the uh, Chile event uh, from 1960. But this also um, is where um, I, I want to begin talking about the impacts to local government uh, following a disaster and um, that uh, when you uh, – we, we used a term in our team when we were there um, very respectfully, but saying – that uh, the local government was basically decapitated by uh, this event in so many areas. And without local government, um, the community members uh, had to improvise, had to, to fend for themselves, had to wait for prefecture-level assistance to come in. And, um, and in many cases, it was a while before they had uh, national-level assistance, too. Likewise, in Miyako, um, this is a photo uh, showing uh, a single-engine fire station that was overwhelmed. And um, I didn't see any evidence uh, in the area that we were in whether they had any remaining fire service uh, for that area. So I'm not sure. But it still um, you know, makes the case of uh, having your uh, fire service district office in the hazard zone and it's taken out, um, it really removes a very important critical uh, role of government to, to be there to perform immediately following this event. Um, and uh, this occurred in a number of areas uh, uh, where we saw, for example, here in Kamaishi, um, this is the uh, central head police headquarters that was located adjacent to the harbor. and. Um, if you can see the, the, the kind of the bridgeway between the two sections of the building, there's a car that's wedged up there. This, this facility was closed due to tsunami inundation damage, and they uh, were, ended up using the, the parking lot as a, uh, a sorting yard for damaged cars. Uh, we were very fortunate, um, and especially relied heavily on our uh, local uh, Japanese colleagues, our research uh, uh, counterparts to set up a lot of interviews and um, and time that we could spend uh, with local officials just talking about 
what the issues were that they were dealing with, that they had been dealing with. And in uh, Ishinomaki City Hall, we uh, spent a fair amount of time uh, talking about uh, how long it took for them to resume service uh, at a city function. And they said they were out of service about one month because they basically had standing uh, contaminated tsunami salt water uh, in their building for the better part of a week. Uh, but this is a big problem uh, for a jurisdiction that needs to quickly start um, doing uh, a, a whole list of uh, emergency operations for their um, for their people, um, such as disaster registration and and trying to uh, track where people are in shelters and uh, register people whose homes have been lost or damaged or need inspections. Um, it was a month out before they basically were able to get this uh, up and running again, and uh, they had said that they they really had a, they, a lot of people that they really couldn't account for in terms of where there were you know a huge number of their population had been dispersed uh, across uh, the area either in the prefecture or other areas with friends or relatives or in shelters. Um, I had even asked uh, about. Um, um, continuity planning for the government when we were there and um, they had said well that's something that usually is done by businesses but uh, the gentleman who was giving us the tour didn't at the time say that or, or uh, acknowledge that that's something that uh, the governments have a role to, to have in terms of having redundancy for their services we went to a, a school that had been turned into a shelter immediately after the tsunami they had flooding up to the roof of their first floor and there were, I think, about 75 uh, evacuees who were there. Many of them had been there since the event, or for about 100 days. And one of the things, uh, and any number of issues that uh, were being relayed to us, was how challenging it was to transition these people out of the shelters. That um, many of these people were older, um, and they had a reluctance to leave the shelters because it meant they would have to give up a certain level of service they came to be uh, accustomed to, especially with their life being so disrupted, and the responsibilities that they would have to take on when they would go to short-term ha term housing. Um, they uh, And so this meant that it took longer for the school to be reoccupied by students instead of evacuees. Uh, in terms of short-term housing, um, we were told that uh, they estimated about 70,000 units would be ultimately necessary, and by Late June, they had about half of those assembled. Um, in Japan, the the local prefecture, or the prefecture is responsible for the contracts to get these put in, but it's the local community that has the responsibility for siting uh, these facilities, for uh, getting uh, power and water, gas, electricity, uh, sewage, any number of things tied into these areas. And when local government is uh, is knocked off its feet, it means that there were probably a lot of delays um, or the, the need for the prefecture to have to assume the responsibility for this. So um, it's, it's impressive, nonetheless, what they were able to accomplish, but they were still having a very hard time meeting the needs that they had. Um, another thing uh, was basically locating these uh, areas, you know, there's not a lot of usable, buildable land in uh, this area of Japan because it's so mountainous that most of the communities have settled on the, the prime land, and that's been, in many places, destroyed by the tsunami. And so finding areas where you can stage short-term housing uh, was, uh, was very challenging. But once people would relocate to these areas, one of the other big issues was that, um, that they, these people are isolated that a lot of these housing, uh, 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 short-term housing areas are um, in places where they're not necessarily next to uh, surviving business districts or schools, uh, that there's uh, limited bus service to these places, and, and most people have lost their cars in the event, so they have uh, little or no means for getting around too. And so they were physically isolated and culturally isolated, and it just meant another added hardship for a lot of people to uh, to to go and move into these short-term housing areas, which we were told were estimated to be uh, used for maybe two to three years, but uh, we think it may be longer than that. 
we were also very privileged to uh, have a couple of meetings with um, social welfare offices talking about vulnerable populations in the area. Uh, uh, th there's a lot of demographic research uh, that I'm sure people have seen at least references to uh, the high percentage of people uh, who were seniors there, and uh, so therefore the, they represented uh, uh, high degrees of both the mortality and the people who were displaced. Um, and this uh, in itself is a challenge for people uh, needing medications where they've lost medical records, any number of things um, that uh, was um, a, a, a huge level of care that was necessary for a lot of these people. But uh, we also had um, a, a, very, uh, um, a very strong uh, interaction with one of the, the groups that were there, a, a non-government organization that um, uh, worked with people with disabilities, and they were just saying how challenging it's frust and frustrating it's been for them to go into these shelters and into these local communities and try and seek out um, people that they've had registered for needs for people with mobility issues or hearing or, uh, or blindness or diabetes, any number of, of things that they would be typically on a day-to-day -day basis providing care for, but the, the existing privacy laws that were in place by, the, by Japan prevented these shelters or governments from disclosing the names of who these people were. And um, uh, it, uh, it makes me ask or wonder whether or not this is uh, an issue that, that, uh, that, that will be a hindrance for us, too, uh, in our disaster registry system. Um, I gave a briefing just uh, the other week to our um, medical examiner's office because they're interested in doing mass casualty planning and this was something uh, that I had found um, that um, you know in Japan the, the traditionally uh, cremations are uh, how uh, funeral services are done and um, that between the damage to the facilities and the number of, of people who had uh, been killed uh, hundreds in many communities um, they didn't have the means to properly uh, have services, so they were uh, having to do these these very organized uh, burials uh, in these these uh, trenches to go back and later exhume the uh, the dead for the loved ones to have a formal service uh, at a future date. But um, you know how we manage uh, the casualties uh, for our coastline uh, is something that there has to be serious planning for as well. And debris management um, comes up over and over again in terms of the, the, the monumental scale of what to do with all of this material. And uh, I, I have the slide listed for coastal Oregon, but it can certainly apply uh, anywhere along the Pacific coast uh, for one of these events. And um, the, the challenges uh, of what to do with all of this, especially when you've got contaminated material, when some of it uh, has hazardous waste, uh, it's uh, it's no small thing to to sort and find uh, a future long-term housing for this stuff. Uh, this is an air photo just showing this kind of a mat of damaged uh, homes, splintered homes that uh, had been pushed by the tides a couple of days out into an inlet, and uh, is uh, uh, at least illustrative of uh, all of the debris that's uh, out in the Pacific uh, circling and. Um, I'm sure causing lots of different consequences uh, environmentally for the type of material that's out there. Um, this is also an illustration of the kind of sorting yards that we passed uh, numerous times. And, um, you know, the, the, the downed utility pole that's in the foreground um, is uh, very indicative of the fact that, you know, everything that touched salt water is basically corroding. And so, um, you know, not only does the pole have to be replaced, but all of the electrical lines, whether they're underground or above, um, you know, it just it's it's not one thing just to have uh, these facilities damaged, but the salt water and the contaminated salt water issues just further compound uh, all of the the work that's involved in both the cleanup and uh, the reconstruction. And um, a lot of the debris uh, is basic, was basically unseen. So much of the material that uh, was damaged was also drawn down uh, with the tsunami out into the bays and harbors. And so 
uh, this photo was when we were right there in Miyako uh, having a briefing by the prefecture officials. And uh, this kind of stuff was still being dredged up from the bottom of the harbor. Um, and uh, you can just imagine um, the kind of material and the potential problems that lurk unseen uh, under the water surface uh, all along the Japanese coast. And then volunteers. Uh, volunteer management is uh, always um, a, a, a real important uh, job, but it's also a, a, a big responsibility for emergency managers uh, and uh, non-government uh, organizations after a disaster. Uh, this uh, Ishinomake University, the Senshu University, was just in the process of getting a memorandum of understanding underway. Um, when the event hit, and uh, although uh, they were, since they were unaffected, they decided to go ahead and stage this this area where volunteers could uh, come, and they they had to camp or basically sleep in their cars in order not to displace uh, people uh, from areas of lodging. But I just uh, I took this shot uh, at one of these kind of a training um, buildings, and um, I think it's it's just important to realize. Uh, also, how much work and materials have to be mobilized to to utilize volunteers effectively, and uh, training that goes on. Um, uh, on the left hand, uh, you know, this poster kind of illustrates all of the different conditions that uh, these volunteers will face when they're out in the field trying to clean up houses and different areas. Um, you don't know what level of uh, training or education or dependability uh, you have, and so. Uh, managing volunteers in a situation like this uh, is a huge undertaking. We were just talking about uh, what would it take uh, to get uh, tetanus shots for for all of these people before they're uh, going out and being exposed to uh, this. And um, uh, that single thing is a huge public health uh, um, workload uh, following a disaster. And so. Um, the reconstruction and recovery uh, conversations were really just getting underway when we were there about three months out. Uh, I mean, debris clearing um, and uh, the, the, the later phases of the response were, were basically uh, winding up. And this is a slide that just illustrates this kind of a concept in that, uh, that box that um, the, the communities really needed to um, embrace remain no they they have to live with the sea and earth in these areas but that they need to come back in and create a sense of uh, what hometown means uh, to be there um, and to try and start addressing what the the issues are and the the necessities for rehabilitation in all of these different sectors of their communities uh, land use uh, especially was uh, the center of the of the conversation in terms of how do you go back in and um, Reestablish uh, these kinds of um, uh, hierarchies, I guess, spatially of where do you have your residential and your industrial and the port, and do you rebuild your breakwater wall uh, to a higher level now? Uh, do you have um, these different types of, um, of of systems to provide protection and evacuation for uh, you know different residential areas? Uh, this is just yet again another kind of a conceptual diagram that shows a number of different um, kind of situations where you may have a broad plain or you may have some steep mountain areas where you have to uh, make cut slopes to reestablish uh, housing or you have elevated areas or you use debris to build these levees to, to create uh, kind of protective berms. Uh, all of these types of things were basically a part of the conversation of uh, how do these communities reestablish themselves. And uh, likewise for, for our coastal communities, these are conversations that would best be had prior to an event happening rather waiting till uh, after uh, and you're dealing with all of uh, the rest of the complications. And so I just have a few s slides um, that I had gotten from uh, this Andrew Burton photo site. Uh, he's a USA Today photographer, but I thought they're very um, they're very powerful in this whole step that people have to take when they re-enter the disaster zone and have to start trying to assess what their next steps are, uh, picking up the pieces of what once was their day-to-day -day lives, 
and trying to find this pathway of uh, what is next. And if local government uh, has been uh, uh, destroyed or, or severely impacted, um, it's very hard for these people to have a real sense of framework or guidance on, on what to do. Um, I know there were a number of uh, places that had moratoriums on rebuilding, but um, you can only imagine the need for having public process right now to reach out and work with these people and help to give them some sense of hope and guidance as they're working through this, uh, picking their, their lives and getting, uh, getting everything back into place. Also, um, uh, people having to improvise, uh, you know, whether or not these people are siphoning uh, gas to power their vehicle or to use as fuel, um, I think it's just um, a, a stark reminder on, you know, how basically people were still struggling in late winter to get by uh, in areas where there was very little assistance for a long time. And then this image, I guess to me, is uh, the one that um, leads into uh, the closing here about disaster recovery planning. Um, you know, if you don't have a pre-disaster recovery plan, um, you're really just, you know, striding into uh, the unknown uh, because um, it's it's so important to try and frame at least what your goals and objectives are uh, going forward before the disaster happens. Otherwise, you're you're really dealing with so many political issues um, and uh, the, the the challenges from all directions in terms of to go back to whatever normal was before and uh, what you're going to base your decisions on. Um, it's, it's so important to, to have some sense of a plan uh, that's there for you when this occurs. Um, this is, uh, I think, a, it's a nice article that I, I kept referring back to, and I wanted to just call the attention back to Tsunami, Minami Senriku, where um, this little community basically had nothing and uh, the mayor was just saying it's so hard to start over with nothing, where some communities had portions of their economic sector intact. They had uh, areas of their uh, residential housing that were intact. They, they had major highways or, or port facilities. They were able to leverage what they did have to get more back in. And for a community like theirs, um, they're just struggling basically with um, – without anything to leverage. And uh, these towns are just kind of stuck in limbo, as the, the article says, um, in trying to get people back in town to get commitments to go forward and to get businesses to make commitments to get back in place, too. And so uh, in, in basically wrapping up, um, pre-disaster recovery planning is something that I know CREW has been invested in since at least 2006, when I was more involved with them. We held a Ken Beach workshop back then, and I think uh, one of the biggest takeaways for me was uh, really to have a visioning process for the community about what they, how they would see their community uh, following the disaster, that uh, even having some goals uh, in place of, of how you would do it differently is, is a lot more uh, uh, to work with than, than starting with nothing. But these, uh, these plans certainly need to be very public in uh, the participatory process, and then they, you, you definitely need to have consensus uh, on what decisions are because those decisions will be um, contested. But uh, if, if at least you can demonstrate that the work that went into creating this plan was legitimate and, and vetted, uh, it really will help uh, as a roadmap going forward. Uh, the statements at the bottom, I think, are... Uh, based on my opening comments. Um, what's it going to take for us to have uh, our paradigm shift? That someday it will have already happened, and then we will understand and know. But until then, um, we are the first generation and, and of the modern age that, that really understands that this is happening. And so it's really um, a responsibility of ours to try and make a difference and to promote um, some sense of getting this paradigm shift integrated into the fabric of our, our societies. And so one example I wanted to conclude with is uh, that um, OSPAC, Oregon Seismic Safety Policy Advisory Commission, uh, has been um, named as the, uh, 
the lead for the Oregon uh, Cascadia Earthquake and Tsunami Disaster Resilience Plan. Um, it was uh, adopted by the legislature about a month after the, the Tohoku event, and uh, that we're just now working out our strategy, um, meeting with the governor's uh, uh, policy advisor um, to start trying to plan the, the best approach for presenting this both to the legislature and the governor's office. That, uh, you know, initially we, we were just saying this needs to be a 50-year approach, that there's nothing you're going to achieve um, overnight, that uh, we really have to just start investing and making commitments and taking these sustained steps forward. Um, but um, we really wanted to make sure that this plan isn't framed as an emergency management issue, uh, that it really, I felt like especially, it wouldn't get a lot of traction if it was seen simply as a disaster, that it really has to be uh, grounded in, in, in more of the sustainability movement the same way that uh, energy efficiency and uh, uh, you know, uh, water issues, all of those long-term issues that are in the 20 and 40 year planning range for communities, that this uh, uh, Cascadia event needs to be a part of the decision making in the public and private development sectors that um, we've been looking at the Spur Disaster Resilient City uh, model. Chris Poland from Degg and Kolb Engineers had recently given us a presentation on it. And um, I think the challenge for us is how do you uh, scale that from a city uh, that's seven by seven miles uh, up to uh, a state, or at least the western portion of that state? Um, I think there's a lot of things that we can uh, learn from uh, their outline, but uh, we certainly need to make it uh, our own. Um, we're currently seeking uh, to build an advisory panel of stakeholders, um, and we want their input as well as their support uh, when we do go to the legislature and the governor. Um, and that, uh, I guess, lastly, just realizing for us who are working on this, that trying to have a proactive approach to this is going to be slow. That uh, as someone who is uh, a, a hazard mitigation uh, coordinator, and I've done this all my professional life, that, um, that uh, these kinds of uh, proactive steps are always hard-fought successes at getting them implemented, uh, that they don't happen overnight, and it's all about building uh, this, this kind of a culture of doing things this way. So that's, um, that's my last slide. I'm coming in right at uh, about 11 o'clock, and so I'm uh, going to uh, turn uh, this over to Heidi as the moderator, um, if people have submitted uh, questions, certainly for me, I'm uh, able to answer them, or also, uh, I guess, if there's any questions for crew uh, as well. Um, yes, Jay, um, this is yes, Heidi. Um, we haven't received any questions so far, so if there are any questions, please feel free to go ahead and send them in via the question and answer area on your desktop. Um, Did everybody hear that okay? Hear that okay? Um. We have one question, um, Jay, and it is, what is the long-term prognosis for recovery in Japan? Um, well, I'll have to first just admit uh, uh, I haven't been uh, investing a lot of time uh, tracking the, re you know, the current research that's been going on for um, the long-term uh, recovery there, um, aside from just articles that I read and uh, people like Claire Rubin, who has a wonderful blog called uh, Recovery Diva, who's uh, putting posts intermittently on there. Um, I, I mean, I think uh, it, if you look at um, a place like Kobe from the, the 1995 event, uh, you know, 10 years is usually kind of a benchmark for recovery. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, I think that uh, it's you know, any of the individual cities, uh, it's, it's probably hard to compare them. I think a place like Kesanuma, I think I've read, is um, 
is, is leveraging this event to do changes for uh, economic downturns they'd had in their tourism and looking at, uh, at, at the smart ways of rebuilding their areas. A lot of these places have been affected by coastal subsidence, and so uh, many of their uh, districts, uh, agriculture, uh, are, are now in the area that's inundated at high tide. And so um, uh, I think um, even even nine months out, I think the, there are still a lot of decisions for the, the Japanese communities to make. And I think this is one thing that we really, as local emergency officials, local public officials, um, we need to start um, working with the researchers who are out there to better understand what the decision points are for these people. Where, where are the timelines and the, what are the issues that they're having to consider at certain crossroads? Um, and so um, uh, I'll leave it right there. Um, Jay, there is another question, and um, it, they asked, what are they doing with all the debris in Japan? Um, uh, again, um, as, a, as a local emergency manager, I haven't really been afforded the, uh, the time to dedicate to, to do sustained and continued research uh, on uh, Japan specifically, other than trying to bring the issues they're dealing with here uh, for the, the the jumping off point for conversations, uh, so um, knowing that they had between 23 and 25 million tons of debris, um, uh, I think they've got long-term challenges on how they're going to manage and recycle. I guess I I would say optimistically, uh, I did see a lot of effort uh, when when we were there at at that they were doing towards recycling. Um, uh, and it was impressive to see the level of staging that was going on. Um, I think probably uh, we will be able to learn a lot um, as uh, time progresses for us uh, in terms of the the way that they've managed this, especially when they have such limited uh, areas for uh, disposing of this material. Um, here's another question, Jay. While you were in Japan, did you learn anything about the health and medical infrastructure and the tsunami's impact on it? Um, our group, while we ask a few questions about um, the greater health sector, and uh, we actually had a, um, a, an interview in Minami Senriku with the, a local professor along with uh, some of the the, the fishermen who were there just talking about the impacts to their hospital um, and what that's meant uh, to them three months out to not have a hospital facility in the area. Um, um, but, um, you know, looking at it at a national scale, um, uh, it was an area that, uh, that our group didn't specifically have uh, a directive to look at. I'm, I'm sorry, my wife's a public health nurse too. And, uh, this was one thing that we've um, continued to try and keep our eyes open in terms of, um, you know, what changes there may be in place for certainly siting hospitals in areas uh, prone to tsunami inundation, um, as well as uh, surge capacity um, and, uh, you know, regional uh, levels of support uh, in the big disasters like this. Um, here's another comment. It's interesting to see some of the buildings that would the tsunami forces, particularly steel and concrete. Do you know um, what peak ground accelerations those buildings withstood during the earthquake itself? Um, I know that there were areas that had fairly high, uh, you know, very strong ground accelerations. Uh, I think some of them were inland, uh, actually, um, but um, individually for some of those buildings, I don't know. Um, um, I mean, I think if you, you know, just looking at the photographs that were taken prior to the tsunami, most of the built environment survived just fine, uh, uh, at least in terms of, uh, you know, not having serious uh, collapses. Uh, so I think um, based on their uh, 
continued investments in, in building codes. Um, and uh, the fact that um, you know a lot of the videos and, and personal accounts that the ground shaking was uh, long rolling and uh, sustained but um, not violent, that um, I think it, it wasn't the earthquake that, uh, that did all the damage. It was uh, the tsunami that came in afterwards. Um, another question, and um, can you discuss how local PGAs factored into the consequences of the Tohoku seismic event? Or did we just talk about that? Yeah, well, uh, here again, uh, our group didn't really focus much on the impacts from the earthquake event. Um, I would just say um, there's, there, in fact, our group was, was really, um, as primarily social scientists uh, who were on this group and were looking at the effects to the to government and uh, and to society in general, um, that there is so much information that is out there on both the geophysical uh, dimensions of the earthquake event as well as the engineering aspects. Um, EERI uh, has uh, a site dedicated to the Tohoku event and. Um, that's primarily what they're tracking and providing resources for. And um, I would even expect that uh, the AGU conference in San Francisco this week has probably got a lot of uh, emphasis on that. So um, I just have to uh, acknowledge that uh, our group was primarily there to look at people uh, as opposed to uh, the performance of, uh, of buildings. Um, and then there is one question, I believe it's specifically about um, the Oregon governor. Have you had a chance to give this presentation to Governor Kitzhaber's public safety advisor, Cameron Smith, and their group? Um, no, I have not directly. Um, I know he's uh, he's someone that we've, the, the chair of OSPAC and I uh, have, have reached out to and spoken to, and we're going to be meeting with him uh, next week, actually a week from today, uh, to go over this. And uh, given the opportunity, um, uh, we would really much like to have a chance to, to share either this or some portion of, of our collective, uh, um, uh, both uh, you know, images and materials from the Japan event as a, a placeholder for uh, starting our discussion on our resiliency plan. Okay. Um, if there was one message you would like Oregon and regional businesses to take away, what would that be? Um, I mean, really, it would be um, about, you know, start with what you can in terms of uh, making an investment towards the future of uh, the, the reality that this event will someday happen. Um, you know, in giving public presentations uh, every year to people um, who do get overwhelmed by the intensity of, of this message, um, I always say just prepare for, you know, the, the annual things, uh, the winter storms and the floods, and that gives you a leg up at least on being personally prepared. As a, you know, for businesses and communities, I think it's really about establishing these linkages getting to know uh, one another and what your roles and responsibilities are. Start working on uh, continuity plans and recovery plans. And um, really, ideally, it would be good for communities to tie the, their recovery planning and back to what their, their existing mitigation plans have already identified as vulnerabilities. In many ways, the, the existing hazard mitigation plans that they're required to have are a very good framework for starting with um, where they think their uh, their challenges might be in the future. Okay, um, and then maybe this will be the last question, Jay. Um, in terms of catastrophic events, are there any significant lessons learned or differences between the Japan earthquake response and recovery and the U.S. response recovery efforts associated with Katrina? Mm. Well, it's a hard one. Uh, uh, it is, well, uh, depending on which direction you want to go. I mean, I think both of these really um, uh, meet the 
the definition of a catastrophe uh, above and beyond a disaster where um, all of the, the local state or prefecture level and then national level uh, plans and, and, uh, and assets are, are not enough to meet the needs. Um, and uh, certainly that was true um, in how uh, responses were brought in for Katrina uh, in, in terms of having the level of, of damage that was uh, at such a regional extent and uh, in such a concentrated area. But um, for uh, the San Riku coast, um, you know, we met with uh, the second or third uh, in command for their uh, um, disaster preparedness office. Uh, he was like their response director, and he was acknowledging how their national plans had always basically trained and operated with the assumption that they would only have to work at one prefecture at a time, that um, they hadn't really developed a plan to, to have to to go in and work uh, at the at the prefecture level in two or three at a time, or even four, I think. Uh, and of course, the the, um, the nuclear uh, incident uh, complicated that even further. But um, certainly, it's good that FEMA is starting to pay more attention to the the Cascadia event. Certainly, just like they are with New Madrid, they're having these plans that involve multiple states instead of single states. Um, and I think uh, that's at least the basis for trying to have the assumptions operate on a much broader level uh, in terms of the, the scale of national uh, resources gonna, that are going to be necessary, not just regional. Well, thank you, Jay. This is Josh again. I want to thank everybody um, who participated in the, in the webinar today and stayed on for questions. Um, again, this is the first in a series of webinars on uh, mitigation and recovery that CRU will be hosting uh, over the next year. Um, we don't have a date yet, but in February, John Schilling with uh, Washington Emergency Division will be giving a presentation. And then again in April, uh, Taryn Moore with uh, um, um, Emergency Management British Columbia will be giving a presentation on uh, cost-benefit analysis. So please stay tuned for uh, more information, specific information about those dates. We encourage you to um, participate in those in future webinars. Um, and uh, also, just a reminder, this uh, Jay Wilson's presentation um, will be posted to the CREW website. Uh, so if you want to share it with others, review it again, um, you'll be able to do so uh, by finding it at the CREW website, www.crew.org. Um, again, uh, Jay, I want to thank you for uh, agreeing to be our lead-off speaker um, on this series. I think it's extremely important for communities um, up and down the, the West Coast um, uh, within the Cascadia subduction zone to get engaged in, uh, in this paradigm shift, to be thinking about um, planning for uh, catastrophic events like this uh, at the community level, at the government level, at the business level. Uh, now, uh, so we don't have uh, the same kinds of issues that uh, J Japan is experiencing in terms of just not knowing which direction to go. So I appreciate you uh, you uh, taking the time to go over there and bring the information back. And uh, crew looks forward to uh, partnering with you and um, um, other states uh, that are working on these efforts in the future. And uh, we'll look forward to having you back. Thank you, Josh, and thank you, Heidi. Thank you, everyone who uh, attended.